Hey everyone, this is your uh, September 14th edition of the Community Weekly Call for Chaos. I'm Elizabeth, uh, your Chaos Community Manager. So it's great to see everybody here again today. Um, you have a thousand other things going on, I'm sure, but you took time out of your day today to show up. So thank you, we appreciate you. I uh, will drop the minutes in here. Nope, that's not the right thing. It's hard. Here we go. I already put the minutes in. Oh, yes, you did. So did. Oh no. Okay. Um. All right. And we were just talking about chaos, kind of a little bit, and the idea of that someday, when we're big enough, we will share full-size candy bars, like the LF does. Um. And Beth Hancock has just said that we should use that as an icebreaker. Oh, that's a good idea. I like that a lot. Maybe we'll have to think about that. You mean for the these meetings, Beth, or at ChaosCon? Oh, well, since we're sharing candy, I thought probably someplace where we would actually be in touch with each other. It could be like, hey, this is my Reese's peanut butter cup out of the four pack. I'm going to go find three other people and give them a Reese's peanut butter cup and get to know them. That's a lovely idea. I like that a lot. We'll add that to the list of things, <laughs> things that we could do. I like that. Okay, so let's jump into, um, now that I'm hungry, we're gonna jump into the metrics freeze and review period, which is currently happening. Uh, we have about all, a little over two weeks left. To, it'll be till the end of, uh, end of December, end of September, this is September, um, until the freeze is over and the metrics will be released. So if you have not had a chance yet to look through, there are 16 metrics. Um, the list is, we can provide that for you if you need it, but you can also check the weekly newsletters because I put them in there every single week. So go back and look at your weekly newsletters and you can see the full list right there. Or you can also go to chaos.community slash metrics and you will see the ones that are indicate, uh, indicated that says uh, under review. So please have a look at those, offer any comments or plus ones, thumbs up, whatever you want would be great. We would really appreciate that. And it makes the uh, it makes our metrics better when we have more eyes on them. So you have a little bit over two weeks to do that. I see people are adding notes on here under this. Um, we wanna talk about the checklists next, uh, the status of those checklists and the enforcement policy. So who would like to talk about that? Uh, I, I added these ones here. I'm wondering, we have these checklists that we're checking off about each metric. I'm wondering what, what's going to happen as a result of that, like how, how each working group is doing and also how are we going to enforce if, if the checklist isn't completely checked off to them, does the metric not make it or I'm just not sure how that works. I think that, Great question. It's the, the working group's responsibility to make sure that the, the stuff on the checklists are uh, checked off. Uh, the first, the first part of the checklist is something that we actually do during the release, and then there are uh, the second part of the checklist is about kind of quality and uh, structure. So, if you're reviewing metrics, it's it's actually the the checklist is actually kind of nice to take a peek at the second part. Uh, because it does have some specific quality checks for the uh, for the metrics themselves, uh, but it, but in general, as far as enforcing the checklist policy, I think it's uh, as as always, it's up to the it's kind of up to the working groups to tell us when the metric is ready for release, uh, and if so, if they tell us that it's ready for release, then we will take their word for it and assume that they've gone through the quality checklist. Thanks for the clarification there. I'll try and um, capture that in the note. Does anybody have any other questions or comments on that? We have 16 metrics I learned. It's a lot. And we also have some changes to some focus areas as well. I think in two working groups, maybe, I remember. Common, common renamed uh, their focus areas. And then value added the academic focus area as well. Correct. Uh, 
Um, we, we actually uh, removed a couple metrics as well, uh, or they two metrics in DEI merged into one metric. So yeah, a lot of activity. We were so busy. I just love that. Even in the summer, like look how much we got done. Amazing. Y'all should be proud of yourselves. Um, okay, should we move on? Are we good? All good. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about the code of conduct team update. But I, that was me. It's just a short thing. Just so you know, we're looking at, I think the code of conduct team uh, has been Ildico, Georg, and Armstrong. So thank you. And I think it's supposed to rotate every two years. And so we're just kind of looking in to the process of how that rotation would occur. Just so people know. People have questions about that? No, it seems, it seems uh, like a pretty reasonable, simple update. All right. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is DEI additions to metrics. Also me. So uh, we, as many of you know, we've been working on uh, our own chaos reflection with respect to DEI. So how the chaos project can, can just really work to better center DEI within the work that we do. And we've updated the metrics template to include um, just any commentary of how any metric, uh, no matter what working group it's in, could be understood in the context of DEI. As part of this reflection team too, we've also gone through a whole number of released metrics already and identified uh, different ways in which some of the metrics could be used to uh, kind of reveal DEI within a project. And so we have those changes. I'm going to be going through once the release is done. So following the release, I'm going to go back through and add those sentences to the metrics uh, where the, the um, reflection team kind of thinks they'd be appropriate. And then the working groups can comment back, of course, you know, but I'm just going to be adding like a sentence or two to probably about 30 metrics across, maybe not that many, but I forget. Um, so look for that following the release. I'm not doing that right now. So those those edits to those 30 metrics that will be on the next release. Correct. Okay. And those will also have to go through translations to write that. Yeah, exactly. So maybe there'd be a like a. I'm trying to think. Maybe there's like a simple way that. We can really just point out like it's just this sentence that needs to be added so that we don't say please retranslate this entire thing. So I'll, we'll think about that. I mean, they can just they can just look at the, the diff. Oh, I suppose so. <laughs> I suppose that's a technical simple way to see the difference. <laughs> All right. Does uh, anyone have questions about this or comments? Want to talk about it more? It's a really good group of people who have been making these suggested changes or suggested updates to the to the metrics. Oh, the uh, the quality checklist actually there is a checkbox for this particular item as well. So, okay, um, one of one of the when you were doing the release, one of the things that we're asking is to reflect on uh dei within the objectives of each metric so yep. there is actually a checklist item for that that right says on. metric okay. includes a uh, reflection on dei cool all right um we can go ahead and move on if nobody has anything else okay uh making chaos data available hmm. it's also me <laughs> See, I, I've done a lot in the last week. <laughs> There's so many things that I have to tell everybody. Um, so one of the things that we are that came up in a discussion yesterday was 
possibly um, making um, repository data available for for academics. So the chaos project is is really built with um, folks from industry and, and folks from the academic setting. And so one of the big things from an academic perspective is getting good, reliable data with respect to um, repository work. Right. And so there was a project called GH Torrent. Was that it, Sean? Yep. GH Torrent. Yep. Um, that I think wasn't didn't Augur use that data for a while? We, yeah, the very, very earliest version of Augur used GH Torrent data. And, um, you know, we've since gone to gathering all of our own. And I think I think I know what you're going to talk about next. So go for it. Well, that's, that's just it. So <laughs> it, Augur is gathering data across repositories kind of at scale and Grimoire Lab. Um, can do the same thing, making data sets available to academics to actually use and analyze um, to discover things about community activity that we may not be able to discover or we're not looking at or whatever it might be um, to kind of provide, provide that data. Um, there are a lot of things that go with that, right? Obviously, with respect to, to data management and privacy and how we you know, build a community such that if people want to provide feedback on how to improve the data collection, like there are a lot of things that go with this. So this is a this note is a conversation from yesterday, but I think it'd be a real um, potentially huge asset to to people um, in academe that would like to use that data for scientific purposes. So that's that's it. That's where I'm at right now. Good morning. This is Lucas. Hi, Lucas. Good morning, um, Lucas. So I happen to be in a conversation with um, somebody at GitHub uh, this weekend who works on um, policy uh, and um, privacy implications. And he told me there have been, he happened to mention that there have been um, a number of projects to um, spider GitHub and other public repos and compile stats on individual developers. Uh, and that they ran afoul of state level privacy laws. So what I wanna um, add to this conversation about making data available, which I think is a valuable contribution um, is to um, be aware of um, the difficulty of having stats on developers, on particular developers across projects. Yeah, I think, I mean, just to address that, I mean, you raise a very important point. Um, one of the questions that I have for the community as we talk about doing this is, in my opinion, we would remove all individually identifiable information or hash it in some way so that the actual people would not be readily identifiable in any distributed data set. However, I would not I would like to not hash the names of the repos or the repo specific information, which does mean that uh, an ambitious soul could go back and I suppose reverse engineer the hashes, but I think it would be nominally um, less work just to go get the data yourself if that's what you want to do. Mm. Um, but, you know, to what extent um, will people feel protected if we're hashing the names, but not the projects? Um, I think that approach is also in line with what others have taken in terms of removing PII of the people, but not the repo. I know that that's what we've done with our, our public data set around GitHub archive. Um, BigQuery. Um, there's no identifiable information about the people, um, but we leave the repo and both names. Okay. So I think, I think so that would be consistent. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that that's that's what we did. That that's what got by the lawyers. I guess we're we're being recorded. So I don't want to say too much more. But it's it, it got public on its own, uh, and there weren't any issues there. So at least that's the approach that we've taken, and it would be consistent. I'm assuming others have also taken similar approaches, but I'm I'm not as well versed in them. That seems wise to me. Okay. I mean, I think I think we should like just like um, I think we should discuss this further as a community, get it adequately socialized, and have our have some sense of consensus before oh, we do it. It's good. But, Let's just release it. 
Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. I think it's, you know, I think it's the right line in terms of protecting PII. Yeah. But I also recognize there are different perspectives. And I, are, I, I was also going to say there are different research approaches that would require more information. Like I, I was thinking hmm. about Sean and Matt, we interviewed, actually, Matt, you weren't there. Sean and Georg were there when we were interviewing uh, researchers from Berkeley who were looking at the incubator projects of the Apache Foundation. Um, and they were connect, they had to use PII because they were connecting social networks and the impact of social networks on around project uh, and source code development. So in that case, you have to know who the people are because you're trying to build out what that social network looks like in both your communication channels and your source code repository logs. So it, it almost, I mean, like it's nice to have the data set available as like a research asset, but um, potentially also the, the more valuable long-term thing would be a process to share data and, and under like say giving them a set of criteria or a form that they could specify their interest use, use case and the measures that they will take to ensure um, responsible usage of the data because depending on what it is and what they're looking for that might not be sufficient. Was the comment here that there could be a case where um, developer names are shared given researcher adherence to some guidelines as to what they're going to do with that data? Potentially. I mean, we can also just yeah. decide that we're not going to do that. And if they want that information, they have to pull it directly. And then they're held accountable as to GitHub and, and or the platform policies versus us being an intermediary and potentially yeah. assuming liability. So I think it's, it's safer for us to just not do it. But okay. if it's about, say, chaos specific in terms of our own community, then it could be up to us if we want to share that information. So I'm the, yeah, I'm wondering too, like even thinking about the LF data sharing policies, like how much we could talk to folks in legal at LF. Like if we're going to share this, like we'd have to have that discussion anyway, but like if we're, we're going to share a, a public data set, here's kind of what would be in that data set. And then would there be a path to share um, a data set that does include PII under certain conditions, right, as agreed upon by researchers? I think that'd be interesting. Yeah, well, the LF policy is that it's public. So in the LF Insights, they have a stated policy that contributor information is public information and they do not remove it from their dashboards. So that's the stance that they've taken. Um, okay. So if, if we're following LF ones, then it's, le it's less conservative than we've outlined. Okay, gotcha. I would certainly err on the side of conservative, at least me personally. Okay. I mean that that is the that's the general stance that that platforms like GitHub and GitLab take as well. Right? There's no uh, uh, privacy is not something that uh, they are promoting. No, but they they do have the ability to opt out and to redact your information. So because they comply with GDPR, there is the right to be forgotten. And because they're the source data, they can go through and alter historical records. But I guess the sort of the middle awkward ground is if you remove that information, then you've also broken the point of connection of remediation. So that that's where I think the liability piece comes in. Because <laughs> if you export it, and then later someone says, I know all my information in here, updates their settings on GitHub, GitHub strips that, but now the historical record still has them discoverable, and there's no link to redact that information from the disjointed set. Not to say that it's more the only individuals that have come across this problem, but it's the removal of PII essentially just removes that as a potential possibility or issue. Mm -hmm. I guess one of one of the questions I would have about a sh shared data sets it is maybe kind of related to this is the what kind of scope are we looking at? I mean, do we do we really even need to look at contributors? Uh, could we just could we just focus on some uh, smaller data sets uh, and share those rather than trying to be uh, kind of all encompassing? This is everything. You can't. I mean, you can't count a lot of things if you don't have it somewhere. But we could just. I mean, it depends on. From a research perspective, if it's important to you to understand the provenance of your data, then you would want 
to know that there's an actual person behind each contributor and how that's determined by a particular program that gathers data. Augur and Vermore Lab do it differently. And so we want to be, we want to be transparent about it. Um, and that would be harder to do if we didn't share the hashed contributor info, but not impossible. It would just be a sort of a summary level of data that would get shared instead of the whole quote unquote database. So Mike, <clears throat> a question here that's just, is all this information, so is there anything you can get from the API that isn't just like, you can also get from looking at the website if you work hard enough? What you can get from the API is a lot of data at scale. Okay. But everything so, is available on the website in some form. So wouldn't that mean the obfuscation would be enough in the case of um, like, if you wanted to drill down on someone, you could just do it on the public website. Um, yeah, if you're interested in one person. Yeah, so I think that's the, the main worry when you have obfuscation that I understand is that you have that ability to figure out who, who is what. And if that's, I don't know, I'll, I'll disengage here because I don't know enough, but. But um, returning to the original um, proposal, I think it would be um, valuable and um, I can imagine that paper being you know read with interest cool so it sounds like generally good idea things to sort yeah. out in the in between <laughs> i would love to hear more from our potential users uh, that could help to to draw some of these distinctions i would i that that would be the hope right that they have stories to tell that we're not telling I would love to, to hear about that. And I think the other is, I put it up there in one of the points, like as a way to build community around Augur and Grimoire Lab. I mean, not only do you have access to the data, but you have access to the tools that generate the data. And if, you, if you're not seeing what you wanna see, I mean, here are, the, here are the tools that you can contribute to to help get some of that information. All right, thank you, everybody. Awesome. So this uh, conversation will be continued probably several times <laughs> at various meetings in the future. So, mm -hmm. okay, let's go ahead and move on. So we have about 20 minutes left. Um, the next one on here is the chaos shop. And I'm we guessing skip that. we can skip it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then in that case, the next one is updating master to main. Yeah, I, I put this in here. This is just in respect to the um, branch name change that we're working on. I just wanted to, we, we had some ambiguity in the DEI working group on how far this has gone in other working groups. So I was just gonna check in and see if anybody had anything to say about this in regards to other working groups. We do. So we made the change in DEI and it broke one thing, but that one thing has been fixed. Kevin, John, thank you. Kevin, mostly. Kevin, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then Sean is going to be attending group meetings, all group meetings. meetings to kind of talk through the process by which you can get this done technically. And then there's even more. We're going to write a blog post on what the what our goals were with making this change and how it was done uh, technically and both kind of socially within the community to this point, like what needs to be done on GitHub and then how Sean went to each working group. So we'll make a blog post on that as well. And then there's even more, we're gonna to talk to the inclusive naming initiative to, to kind of see if they have published processes uh, that they share and if we can contribute anything to those published processes. And if they don't, maybe we should think about putting something um, working on something with the inclusive naming initiative to, to kind of make that more publicly available for other communities who may be thinking about this as well. How about that for an update? I think you've got it under control. Excellent update. So um, uh, as said earlier, this, this will break the uh, metrics on the website. So if you are doing this, please shout out to me before you do it. I think you can yeah. plan on, do you want it? So I think you can plan on every working group in all likelihood doing it. Um, do you want that to not happen before the 
release of metrics, Kevin. It can, it it can would, be done. It can be done now. You just it will it will break them. So if you if you don't want them broken for a period of time, you need to coordinate with me so I, I know it needs to be done. OK, Sean, when so you do it, after I meet you, I'll just send Kevin an email or post an issue and tag him. OK, it's probably better. Kevin, do you think it would break anything if we also applied that to the um, community, a formerly known as governance repo and the metrics repo? Uh, yes, yes, it will break it will break those documents as well. Uh, so in in that particular case, it'll it'll break uh, sections of the the website itself rather than the individual metric pages because we we pull. We pull documents and content from uh, uh, those repos for the website. Uh, okay. So, so the same goes there. If it's if it, it's it's not a big deal for me to go in and change it. It's just uh, if if you don't want it to be broken for a period of time, uh, reach out to me and let me know it's happening and when it's happening, and I will coordinate my uh, the change. Okay. Cool. Any questions uh, or comments about that? All right. Well, we will move on because we want to. We do have some chaos con things to go over, so we'll move on quickly. Um, just wanted to mention um, that Grimoire Lab is hosting a virtual hackathon as part of the Mining Software Repositories or MSR conference happening in 2022. Um, and so Georg asked me to share that if you would like to participate, if you have ideas, um, this is mostly for researchers, um, speaking of researchers, um, you can register your interest in participating in that hackathon by October 18th, and there's a link to do so right here. It's basically just opening an issue in that repo with your name and some other information that they request. So um, more information is that in that link as well, if you're interested in, in doing that. So that was very exciting and really cool thing to share. Any questions about that? I probably don't have the answer, but I can ask Georg. <laughs> Give it a whirl. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, so the next one is chaos con things. And I think this is for the planning committee. Is that right? That's, I think that's what we said. I think so. Okay, so do we do we have anything else for the general group, the bigger group, or can we go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting and do chaos con planning for the rest of the time? Is that cool? All right, I will stop sharing my screen. If I can actually figure that out, there we go. And I will stop the recording. So thank you everyone for coming and we will see you next week. And of course, if you're on chaos con committee planning, please stay here. Thank you.